Are you all ready? Hand it up with the ace. I'm going to share an idea with you that could not just change your business, but could change this entire company. Now, Vima is, it's got a head of steam built up. You know that. I've been fortunate enough to watch the company grow right from the first day. And I had the pleasure of speaking at the very first meeting. And I've watched this company literally bloom. Around three or four months ago, maybe it wasn't that long, keep in mind I've worked around sales organizations now for 50 years. And three months ago, I got thinking of the idea of retention. And I kept playing with the idea in my mind. And the more I thought about it, the more I wondered why we don't hear more about it. And retention is, it's not talked about that much. And then I thought, I'm going to write a book about it. And so I started to think more about it. Now, if I'm going to make a program or do a book, I usually get a big poster made of it, of the cover. I start out with the cover, and then I fill it in. And so I got thinking about it, retention, retention, retention. They came and they stayed. And I got an idea, and I had this picture in my mind, and I got a hold of an artist, and I had them put this picture together, and I loved it. When I got it, I loved it. Now, there's a couple of lessons in what I'm going to show you here. I got this, and I thought, I'm going to send this to BK and ask him what he thinks. And so this is the picture of the cover. And I had these big block letters, retention, in the sand with the great pyramids in the back. And I thought they'd been there forever. And I sent it to BK and I said, what do you think? And this is what I got back. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Don't use pyramids. And I thought, what the hell? That's a good looking cover. lesson for me, I've been around since there were pyramids. I was working when they were putting them in jail. But I wasn't even thinking of that. I was so locked into the idea of retention that I missed it. And you know, it took me a couple of hours after I got the text back from them, don't use pyramids. And so I said, oh, okay, I won't use pyramids. And I'm saying to myself, and I thought, why in the hell shouldn't I use pyramids? And then all of a sudden, it was like a bell went off on my head, ding, 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 Proctor, wake up. And I thought, oh, my God. So anyway, I sent him a text back, and I said, listen, you've got, you've got one of the best graphic arts department I've ever seen, you make me a cover. And this is all I got back on it. He's a man of your very few words. And so, I don't know, maybe a week, 10 days later, I got about four or five covers back from him. But he said, this is the one that Mark Patterson said, if he was going through an airport and he saw this cover, 
he would buy it. And this was their line. How to win friends and customers and keep them happy for a lifetime. Now, although that's got my name on it, I had nothing to do with the design of it. It was Mark Patterson and Kim Kugler that did that. Give them a hand. You know, I was telling Mark backstage, I work at a lot of conventions, and I've worked at a lot of conventions over the past 40 or 50 years. I have never, ever seen one put on better than this one's been. You know. This is absolutely incredible. Mark Patterson is a branding genius. The guy is something else. And you've got him in your company, so you really want to be proud of that. The guy does a phenomenal job. So... I started to think about this, and I started to give it serious thought, and it kept playing on my mind, why isn't there more talk about retention? Why, why isn't it right up at the top when it comes to priority? So I took a look at it, what is retention? And not only what is it, but what will it do you? And I don't know if I phoned BK or, or text him, and I was talking to him about it, and he laid the key on it of what it is. He said that retention is the holy grail of business. Yet it literally is. Now, what you want to ask yourself is, how much do you talk about it in your organization? How much serious conversation is there? I know you've had a lot of fun here tonight. I want you to get a little bit serious for a few minutes. This is without question one of the most important subjects any sales organization could ever spend time with. It is absolutely incredible when you stop and think of what this will do. When you focus on retention, here's just a couple of the things that came to my mind right away. You build your business much faster. Business grows many times faster. Everybody wants their business to grow faster. And yet we don't talk about this that much. It will literally cause your business to grow faster. Your cycles will be multiplied. Now think about that. Everybody's counting cycles. How many cycles do you have? Focus on this, and your cycles are going to be multiplied. That's how important it is. You're going to find you're going to stop wasting time and money. If you spend a lot of time recruiting people into the business, they're coming in the front door and going out the back door. That's a waste of time and money. Yet doesn't even make any sense. So why do we do it? Well, I think it's part of a paradigm. I think it's part of conditioning. It's almost an accepted concept in sales. It's just the way it is. But it doesn't have to be the way it stays. Plus, you're going to develop strong leaders. You just get focusing on this one thing, and you're going to develop strong leaders. You will. And even more important, you're going to find that retention eliminates attrition. Stop and think of all the people that leave this company every month. I don't know what the number is, but I know it's too high. Now think about this. We frequently talk many new people we've got, very little talk about how many we've lost. 
And think of how much energy you put into bringing people into the business. It's all wasted energy when they, if they leave. So you've got to say, geez, it makes sense to think of this. Attrition is a disease in a sales organization. It is definitely a disease in a sales organization. It's a disease that has a very negative impact on your profit, and it has the potential of putting you out of business. And you know something? It puts a lot of people out of business. If you could get a polygraph and suck the truth out of the mind of some people, you're going to find they left because they worked hard at getting the people and the people wouldn't stay. It never entered the person's mind that they were the cause of them not staying. You see, they're in to blame. So this is something I believe that we want to think about. Now, do you know there's 10,000 people here? There's many more than 10,000 people in Vima, but there are 10,000 people here. Do you know that this group has the potential of changing this entire company and this company has the potential of changing the entire industry. It's already changing the industry. Okay. I want to suggest together we fix the idea of retention in our mind. Now I watched you when Eric was up here and he was getting you to be all in. I want to suggest that you make Vima's retention figures the model for the entire industry. Now think about this. This is really serious stuff. Make up your mind that you are going to buy into this idea. You'll say, well, not everybody has to. No, not everybody. You have to. If you buy into it, it will change. It will start catching on. It's a big idea. I want to suggest that you can do this. They come to Vima and they stay. Okay? Now, what we've got to do is just bury that idea in our mind. And we can do that. Let's say Vima's new mantra is retention, retention, retention. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Everybody. Come on, in the back room. If you're at home... I'm going to ask you to get on your feet, and let's go through this. Let's run through it. Retention, retention, retention. Come on. Uh, let's do it one more time. Retention, retention, retention. You can sink that idea in your mind one more time. Let's do it. Retention, retention, retention. Thank you. Now, as you dig into this, you're going to realize that it's a paradigm, really, that we're working on. The company has a paradigm. The paradigm is a culture. The paradigm is group habit. In our mind, it's habit. So we want to look at what is a paradigm, how are paradigms created, and how our paradigms changed. Now this could be worth millions of dollars to each one of you. Paradigms are nothing but a multitude of habits, but they're habits that have been passed down from one generation to the next. We're the product of somebody else's habitual way of thinking. Paradigms literally control the lives of most people most of the time. Now, when we think about that, we talk about habits, that's we wake up and we move into action. And our actions are almost all habitual. There's not a lot of thought given to it. It's habitual. And what we want to do is start changing that. And, you know, if we just start talking about it, if we start thinking about it, if you start masterminding with one or two other people about it, it's going to change a whole lot of things. 
It really will. Now, let's look at this. You have retention on one side and attrition on the other side. Do you know that everything you do is feeding one side or the other? You may say, well, I've never thought of it that way. Well, think of it that way for just a few minutes. Now, let this little drawing represent you, your mind, and your body. And then, let's think of what we do. Are we feeding one side, or are we feeding the other side? There's our conscious mind. In our conscious mind, we gather all kinds of information. So you say, I know this, I know that. Well, that's where the knowledge is right there. Then we have the subconscious, and that's where we have the paradigm. Now, it's not what's going on. It's not what we know that controls our behavior. It's the paradigm that controls the behavior. And if we're going to change the behavior, we have to change the paradigm. And you know something? It's a choice as to which way you're going to go. Now, most people make the choice, but it's an unconscious choice. They make it unconsciously. They don't really think about it. But let's think of this for a moment. You either do what has to be done, or you don't do what has to be done. Why would a person not do what has to be done? Because we're not doing what has to be done. We're feeding the attrition side. We're causing things to leave the business. It's why we feel. It's how we feel. Michelle Barnes said something. I picked it up today. When you don't want to go, it's when you need to go. Why don't people do things? They don't want to do them. And that's when we need to do them. It's because we don't feel comfortable doing it. And we don't feel comfortable because of the ideas or the choices that we're making. And so we don't do the thing that has to be done. Now think of this for a moment. I have heard many people in Vima, I would talk to them about how they're doing, and they say, I just don't have anybody to talk to. Now that isn't true. They probably live in a city of a million or two, but they don't have anybody to talk to. They do have somebody to talk to. It's that they don't feel comfortable talking to them. They don't feel comfortable talking to someone that probably doesn't want to talk to them about something they don't want to talk about. But we've got to get through that wall and get the idea across of what this is all about. You just saw the Alcazan family up here, the entire family. They're earning millions of dollars. They're having a phenomenal time, and they're doing what they love to do. See, the paradigm is the choice. Now, here's something I have found a long time ago. Successful people are willing to do what makes them feel uncomfortable in the interest of growth. Successful people are willing to do what makes them feel uncomfortable in the interest of growth. I remember when I first started to teach seminars or speak. I had studied this for quite a long time. I'd gone through an enormous change in my own life, but I wasn't really sure of what I had done. And so I started to study. It took me about nine years to figure out what I had actually, how I made the change. And when I got it figured out, all I wanted to do was teach it, but I was quiet, and I was shy, and I was withdrawn. I wouldn't even ask a question in a crowd. I really wanted to teach this. The desire to teach it was so strong. And I watched Bill Gold one night working with an audience, and I thought, that guy is so good at what he's doing. And I made up my mind, I was going to learn to do what he was doing, and I was going to get him to teach me. I don't speak anything like Bill Gove did, but Bill Gove taught me how to be comfortable in front of an audience. I was on the elevator the other night with some people. We were going up, and we got Nick on the elevator, and he was saying, you know, he said, I've got to do some speaking here this weekend. He said, can you give me a tip? He said, I've spoke to 400 people, but never thousands. And I said, it's no different. You're just talking to one person. There's a whole bunch of other people listening. And I said, don't worry about what they think of you. What they think of you is not important. It's what you think of you that's important. Fall in love with the idea of helping them. 
And he was shaking his head when I got off the elevator. I think it was sinking in. We've got to learn to do things we feel uncomfortable with, and then pretty soon we'll start to feel comfortable. It's just the way it's got to go. Now, what do you do when you first spot attrition or symptoms of it in your organization? Because it is a disease. Or when you start to see symptoms of defection. Because you do hear about it, and you spot this disease, you spot symptoms of it, I believe what you should do immediately is quarantine it, isolate it, and then treat it. If you are dealing with a disease, that's exactly what you would do. You would quarantine it, you would isolate it, and then you would treat it. Now, how do you treat this? Well, keep thinking about it. Attrition is an effect, and you never treat the effect. You have to treat the cause of the effect. So that causes us to look at retention again. So as you start looking at this, we find the differentiator, especially in a competitive market, is leadership, education, and consistently high standards of service. Now think about this for a moment. It's leadership, education, and consistently high standards of service. If you want to cut down attrition, work toward eliminating it, there it is right there. It's leadership, education, and consistently high standards of service. Now, I have looked at this, and I've looked at this company. I watch it pretty close. I'm very observant of where I'm working, what's going on. And if you look at this, BK and his executive staff are providing tremendous leadership. Now, I'm not saying this to flatter them. I'm saying this to point out to you that that's what they're doing. And all you have to do is look at the results, and the results speak for themselves. There is phenomenal leadership here. You watch this conference grow. Each week it gets bigger and it gets better. You look into it a little further, you're going to find the entire team in the head office are delivering consistently high standards of service. I didn't know who Carolyn Patterson was, but I was getting emails from her, and if I asked her a question, bang, I'd get the answer right back again. And I was mentioning her, Mark, I said, she, she is really good. I met him on the, we were coming down the elevator, and he said, I'm going to take her and some of the others to dinner. She is good. I watch sometimes Linda working with people, and I hear her talking to them, and she walks away, and I'll say, "How?" Did, she says, they're just phenomenal. There's a tremendous team in that head office. So let's look at this. You've got excellent leadership at the top. You've got strong executive staff. You've got a phenomenal office staff. So you have to ask yourself then, why is there attrition? If it's there, why does anybody leave? At some level, the factors that cause retention get neglected. It gets watered down. Now, if you think about it, BK doesn't deal with everybody in the office. He deals with the executive staff. The executive staff deals with managers. The managers deal with people. But then you get out into the field, and it starts to go down, 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 down. There's layers and layers and layers of affiliates. And it gets watered down. And so the leadership, the education, and the consistently high standards of service, it gets watered down. And that's why people leave. People always leave leaders. Almost always. They leave the leader. They don't leave the company. Why do you find a person wanting to jump to another? You'll find, you'll find some affiliates want to go and move to another line. Why would they want to do that? When I was working on this, and I've been working on this for a while, I went in the kitchen one night, and uh, I, I come out of my office, and I, I said to Linda, I said, if, if somebody offered you, and I was being very serious with her, a lot of money. I'm talking about some real big money 
to go to another company with you. And she looked at me. She said, no. Like, she thought I was asking her something bad. I mean, it was just, I shouldn't have been asking. I was just testing her. Why doesn't she want to go? She's happy. Do you think Tom would leave Bethany with her family? No. Think Ruth's going to leave? No. Why? Well, there's probably many reasons why they're happy. They're being fulfilled. Everything they want, they're able to get. They're living the life that they want to live. So it goes back to leadership, education, and consistently high standards of service. Now, Peter Drucker is somebody I love to study. Let's look at what Drucker said about something like this. He said, your first and foremost job as a leader is to take charge of your own energy. Now think about that. Your first and foremost job as a leader is to take charge of your own energy. You've got to make sure you've got your head in the right space. You're looking at your business the right way. You see, if you really pay attention to everything that comes from the platforms here at this conference this weekend, and make up your mind you're just going to take one or two ideas and you're going to burn them into your mind and incorporate them into your life. It's with you. Forget about everybody else. It's for yourself. Your first and foremost job as a leader is to take charge of your own energy. And then help to orchestrate the energy of those around you. I remember Earl Nightingale talking. God, I love listening to that guy. And he said, you know, the first order of business is profit. But he said, if you don't earn a profit, you're going out of business. But he said, that's not the purpose of any human organization. The purpose of all human organizations is to make life more meaningful. Well, I think if you analyze this company, this company is making life more meaningful. Now, would you have to ask, as a leader, because you're the leader of your company, are you doing this? Are you taking charge of your own energy? Then are you orchestrating the energy in your own particular group? I believe we are spiritual beings. I believe we are a soul. I don't think we have one. I think we are one. And I think we've got to find an environment that's conducive to the unfoldment of the soul. We've got genius locked up within us. We've got to learn how to put ourselves into an environment that causes it to come out, bring it to the surface. Now, where does tent retention begin? This is something to think about. I was listening to uh, Alex and Brad today, and I'm not sure which one of them brought it up, but one of them did. And retention begins at your very first meeting. At the very first meeting, it doesn't start after they get to a certain pin level. It starts at the very first meeting. And it's more than giving people what they expect. If you're really going to get them to come and stay, you've got to give them more than they expect. It's about exceeding their expectations. And when you do that, you're going to build loyalty to your group. Now, there's phenomenal loyalty in this company. And more important, you build strong leaders. See, when you, when you really care about the people, and you're really focused on education, when they come into the business, you've got to understand they are not programmed to do what has to be done to build this business. They're going to, have to start doing things they've probably never done before. They're going to have to change their habit patterns. They're going to have to look at this from a totally different perspective, and it's your responsibility to help them become aware of all that. Think of this. People will not leave you or your organization when they feel they're recognized and respected.
They just won't leave you. They're going to stay. And you will find that there's phenomenal loyalty in different groups. You go to the top level, there's phenomenal loyalty amongst all the ambassadors and to the company, to the elite, to the company. When they're in an environment that leaves them feeling fulfilled, they're not going to leave. They're not going to leave. That's what people are really looking for, and most of them don't know it. A high percentage of the population are very frustrated, and they're disturbed, and they're trying to figure out, you know, missing. Well, what's missing is that they don't have a purpose in their life. They don't really have a direction. They wake up in the morning and they hope it's going to be a good day. But when you do have direction and you know exactly where you're going, you make it a good day. Napoleon Hill said, if you're one of those people who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, he said, perish the thought it's not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come if they come and roll in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. So you see, I think the definite demands, it's very important. We've got to demand it of ourselves, And then we have to apply certain principles. It all happens by law. I'm very much into the laws. I believe this whole universe operates by law. Werner von Braun said that the natural laws are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, sending people to the moon, and we can literally time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. He also said these laws must have been set by someone. But everything in the universe operates by law. Well, when we bring our business into harmony with the law, the business is going to grow. When we bring our life into harmony with the law, we're going to grow as individuals. If we're ignoring retention, we're focused in the wrong area. If you're trying to stop attrition, you don't do it by focusing on retrition. It's like if a person's goal is to get out of debt, they probably stay in debt forever. You don't get out of debt by focusing on debt. You attract more debt. You eliminate the debt by focusing on prosperity. When you start focusing on the leadership, the education, and the consistently high levels of service, you're going to start moving away from a lot of the attrition. So we find people coming in, they want to earn money. Well, the money has to be earned. You don't make money. You'll hear people talking about how much they're making. Nobody makes money. People that make money work in the mint or they're in jail or on their way there. Everybody else earns it. Money has to be earned. Yet it's going to come to them in response to definite demands and by applying certain principles. Now let's come back and look at the mind again and think about what we're dealing with. In the conscious mind, we, uh, we build dreams. And we talk to people about dreams. It's one of the biggest things in network marketing. I think it started with DeVos and Van Andel. They, they, they got, they got the, the network marketers really going, and they got them focusing on dreams. They take ordinary people who are struggling, yet they get them to move away from looking at their present situation and build a picture, a dream in their mind. And you know, you can do that very well but it isn't the dream that controls the behavior. The dream does not control your behavior. So you've got people with great big dreams, but not many cycles. they got great big dreams, and they're not building any leaders. they got big dreams, and the results just aren't there. Yet they talk about their dreams, but the results, why aren't the results there? It's because the paradigm is controlling the behavior. They know nothing about it. Go and ask some of the people in your downline what they know about par paradigms. Most of them don't know. Most of their behavioral patterns, every day, every day, every day, they're doing the same thing. And they're not, they're not working on retention. They're trying to get. 
and it doesn't work. Joel Barker wrote a book on paradigms back in 1990. He said to ignore the power of paradigms to influence your judgment. Yes, to put yourself at risk when exploring the future. Paradigms is something you don't hear a lot about. You hear more about it now than you did maybe 10 years ago. But you don't hear a lot about it. You don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And yet paradigms are controlling this company. Paradigms are controlling you. You may say, oh, no, they're not. Well, that's fine. But in 54 years of studying it, I'm thoroughly convinced. I work with psychiatrists. I coach psychiatrists. And you know, some, most of them have never really taken a look at the paradigms. They get into all kinds of analysis and therapy, and they never take a look. I'm working with a woman right now in Toronto. She's the head of the psychiatric group in Toronto. Tina Chata, very, very bright woman. Yet she's talking about the head and the heart, how the merging, the highway between the head and the heart. There's so much we're learning, but we don't learn much about paradigms. Yet paradigms are literally controlling this company. The company operates with a culture. Culture is nothing but group habit. Group habit is a paradigm. But when we bring a person into the business, if they don't look at this, odds are pretty good they're not going to change too much. We've got to help them realize that if they're going to get the dream, you've got to get them to really want it, then they have to work at changing the paradigm. So that's where the education comes in. And if you're the leader, you've got to supply the education. And you make sure that there's consistently high standards of service. If you, as an individual affiliate in this company, if you would use the head office, use BK, his executive staff and the staff, as a benchmark and say, am I measuring up? Am I doing as good a job as they're doing? If you did that, you would find your business improve dramatically. You'd find attrition go down and your retention would go up. Now let's keep looking. You get the conscious mind and the paradigm. Now, if we're going to help the person win, we've got to help them understand how to change the paradigm. I have found that all the material in here is material that I would teach, maybe in a different way, but it's all cover bases for changing paradigms. Now, you may have never looked at it that way, and I know maybe all of you don't use the roadmap, but just you must use something along this line if you're really going to help the people grow. So if, even if you don't use it, if you open your mind for a minute and just look at this the way I've been looking at it here over the past couple of months, just putting this together for this presentation. What you see here are basic steps that must be taken if a person is going to alter their paradigm, and if they go to win, they've got to alter the paradigm. If they don't, they will eventually muster out of the business. Good people, smart people, nice people, but they don't make it. They have to understand how to change a paradigm. Why do you think Solomon said, all you're getting, get understanding? They've got to understand. You see, I think material like this has got to be taught. You don't just give something like this to say somebody, here, study that, fill it in. This isn't like you're getting a driver's license or something. This is a strategy, if you want, to help people earn millions of dollars. Now, if retention is the focus... And beat them is the reward. Then these kind of steps have to be looked at. This is a strategic plan. If you're going to build anything of any consequence, you have to have, I'll lay you odds if you could get into the head office and get into the heads of Mark and BK and Peter and the various. They've got a strategy. They've got a picture where they're going execute it. Well, when you bring a person into this business, frequently 
some of these people have never really been in business before, but they're going into their own business. This is not a job they've got. This is something much bigger. This is an opportunity to live the way people rarely even dream of living. See? I heard Tom tonight, I've heard him say this before, when he came into network marketing, he thought if I could get an extra 200 a month, if I could just get an extra 200 a month, and he ends up with an extra 200 a minute. Take a look at the people in the company. You'll find most of them are quite different personalities. But they're all doing essentially the same thing. They may do it a little different, but they're doing essentially the same thing. They're helping people build dreams, and they make the changes necessary that they have to make in their personality to realize those dreams. And that's the strategy. Now, I want to suggest you really think for a moment. School gave us valuable knowledge. However, school never taught us one thing about changing paradigms. Now, this is rather strange. I find it very strange because I didn't go to school. I went to high school for two months. So the education I got, I got on my own. I didn't get it in a formal situation. But in working with some of these professionals that I work with, I'm always amazed that this isn't something that they really pay attention to. So you'll find a person go out into the world with superior knowledge, and yet they're getting inferior results. Now, that causes a lot of confusion and frustration. And that causes confusion and frustration with a lot of affiliates in this company. They got all kinds of knowledge. They're absolutely brilliant, and yet they're blowing it. They're not making it. Why? Well, let's take another look at it. There's the individual, and there's all the knowledge in their consciousness. You can give them the roadmap or whatever it is that you give in your particular group, and they'll study it. And if you ask them questions, they could probably answer them fairly. But yet, if you look at the results, the results aren't there. The results have no uh, relationship to the knowledge that they have. You'll find people that are absolutely brilliant, and they're broke. Why is that? It's because the part of our mind that has all the knowledge is not the part that's controlling our behavior. And I can assure you, most of the people that you're bringing into your organization today do not understand that. That isn't just being able to repeat it, said it. I'm talking about really understand it. You see, their paradigm is what controls the behavior and causes the result. If the result's going to change, the paradigm has to change. You've got to change the paradigm if you're going to change the results. You've got to build a new paradigm. So then the question comes, well, how do you do that? Well, this is something that I began to look at. I was living in... I, um, I had been given this book. I was 26, and I was losing in a very big way. I really didn't know too much of anything. And the man that gave me to the book, give me this book, he got me to sit down and take a look at myself and my life. Then he said, listen, you can have anything you want, but you're going to have to change your life. And he asked me, what did I read? And I, I said, I can't read. Now, that wasn't true. I could. I couldn't read very well, but I could. And I later found out I read it about as well as most people. Do you know that most people read at about a grade three or four level? And that's because we learn to read by the time we're in grade three or four, and we never improve upon the skill from that point on. Well, at any rate, he said, Napoleon Hill wrote this book. He spent his entire life putting this together. 
He said, I think it would be a very prudent part on your mind if you spent the rest of your life trying to understand and apply what he put together. Now, I really don't know why I decided I was going to do that, but I did, and I started to study it. I was working on the fire department in Toronto. I, uh, it was actually a suburb of Toronto. It was East York. It was broken into many areas. I'd been working there for a few years. No one, one person since 1934 had quit that job, and I quit. I quit because I was reading this book, and I was talking to a couple of people who were in business for themselves. And I became aware that I was never going to earn more money than what the chief decided I would earn. And I knew I'd never be the chief. There was only one chief. And I knew I wasn't a particularly great fireman. And I heard one day a guy said that there was good money cleaning floors. I said, I'm not proud I'll clean floors. I owed everybody I knew money. And I had to borrow a thousand dollars, it was nine hundred and eighty to be exact, to buy a used floor machine and a bucket and a mop. And I was going to start cleaning floors. And when I quit the fire department, everybody thought I was right out of my mind. And they said, What are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to clean floors. And he looked at me and said, Are you serious? And I said, Yeah. I was almost embarrassed to tell them. But I did it. Now, do you know, at the end of the first year, studying that, being coached by a man and doing exactly what he told me, his name was Ray Stanford, I was earning 175000 a year. Now, there's all kinds of people in Vima that start out much the way I was, and at the end of the year, will be earning that kind of money. In less than five years, I was cleaning floors in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, and London, England. And it was when I was in England that I was sitting and I was trying to figure out, what the heck am I, how did this happen? I did not believe that there was an emotional or a capricious God on a cloud that blessed me and left everybody else to swim. I was raised to believe if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. And I knew I wasn't that smart, but I was earning a fair amount of money. I was also raised to believe if you're going to do well in business, you've got to go have a good formal education. I didn't have any. I started to question everything that I believed. And I found that most of my beliefs were absurd. But it took me nine years to figure out why I changed. And when I figured it out, all I wanted to do was teach it. It took me that long to realize I had changed the paradigm. And this is where it starts. See, that's what Stanford got me to do. He got me to sit down and build a vision in my mind. That's why Solomon said, where well, there is no vision, the people will perish. We're not taught what our higher faculties are. We are raised to live through our senses. We go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. But we have higher faculties. We've got perception, intuition, memory, the will, reason, and imagination. The imagination is the mental faculty out of which visions arise. We have to encourage a person to activate their imagination yet begin to build a picture in their mind of where they want to go. I was talking to a young lady in the hotel yesterday, and she said she wanted to be an ambassador, and I said, well, then you've got to act like an ambassador. Well, she said, I'm no. I said, you've got to think like an ambassador. You've got to feel like an ambassador. You've got to act like an ambassador. Yet isn't something you're going to get. Yet something you've got. You see? There's an enormous difference there. Most people are working toward getting there. You've got to already be there. You've got to build the picture and live with it. I suggested that she get the movie, Lawrence of Arabia. She'd never heard of it. I said, well, go and get it. 
I give her my email address, and I said, send me a note after you get it. I said, Peter O'Toole started it, and Peter O'Toole just passed away. T. Lawrence was a British soldier. And just prior to the First World War, he went to fight with the Arabs against the Ottoman Turks in the desert. And they called him Lawrence of Arabia. And that's what they made the movie on. Well, Peter O'Toole, if you watch that movie, he mentally became Lawrence. When you see him riding on the camel and you look at him, he's not acting. He has become Lawrence. Go get the book by Stella Adler, The Art of Acting. It's a phenomenal book. She was one of the greatest acting teachers that ever lived. She was Marlon Brando's teacher. In fact, he wrote the foreword in the book. Now, Stella Adler never actually wrote a book. After she passed away, a man named Kissel took all her lessons and put them in a book. So when you read the book, it's not like you're reading a book. It's like you're going to her acting classes. Now, all the great people, we've got to act like the person we want to become. Well, this isn't just a phrase. This is the actual deal. You've got to build the vision in your mind. Then you've got to buy into the vision. You've got to become it. This was the first thing Bill Gove taught me. Is you're going to see yourself doing what you want to do. Let that idea rule. Don't let the paradigm control you. Build the picture in your consciousness. And that's what you have to do. But you've got to teach the person to do this. That's one of the first steps. Genevieve Biran said, the exercise of the visualizing faculty keeps your mind in order. If there's no order in their mind, there's no order in your outside world. Many of the affiliates, there's no order in their world. They're going this way and that way. There's no order. She said, the exercise of the visualizing faculty keeps your mind in order and attracts to you the things you need to make your life more enjoyable and in an orderly way. She went on to say, if you will train yourself. Train yourself. Get in the practice of holding the image of what you want in your mind, you'll soon find your thoughts and desires will pre proceed in a more orderly procession. In other words, you're not going to be involved in chaotic thinking. We are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. That's it. We are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. The great secret to building your beam of business is a controlled imagination and a well-sustained attention firmly and repeatedly focused on the object to be accomplished. Get the picture in your mind. Play this game for a moment. Ask your imagination, what do you see coming my way this year? Look at your imagination as being some part of you that you can talk to, and it'll talk back to you. Where do you see, do you see coming my way this year? Get your imagination going. Get your heart into it. And then get specific. Really dream. Don't just come to the conference and leave and say, wow, it was great. Leave with a specific dream in your mind and make up your mind what you're going to come back here as on the physical plane at next year's conference. You can take quantum leaps in a year. A year's a long time when you're really applying yourself. Visualizing, it's, it's, it's the biggest thing there is. Now, when I first started, when I first started to read that book and follow Ray's direction, that's what I was, he didn't talk about visualizing because you've got to get a picture of what you want. Then you have to be coachable. Do you know that most people are not coachable? 
I have a coaching company. I'm coaching one person, one person, one on one. He's 21 years old. He's paying me $150,000 to coach him for a year. Last year, he earned a million three. This year, he'll earn four or five million. He's 21 years old. Ted's absolutely brilliant. He's coachable. He's 21, and he's got the mentality of somebody in their 40s or 50s. He's brilliant. But most people are not coachable. I find that people want you to coach them, but they want you to coach them their way. It doesn't work. It does not work. I was very fortunate that I met the man that I did in 1961. I was 26. His name was Ray Stanford, and he said, if you do exactly what I tell you, until you find out that I'm lying to you or that I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, he said, I don't tell lies, and I do know what I'm talking about. And God only knows why I decided I was going to do that. I had never done that with anybody. I was not coachable up to that point, which is the probable reason why I was losing. And I started to do exactly what he told me. And then... I got Earl Nightingale and Lloyd Conant as coaches, then Val Van de Waal, and Dr. C. Harry Roeder, and Bill Gove, and I did exactly what those people told me. It's helped me earn millions of dollars. I sat in a den in a house in Maplewood Lane in Glenview, Illinois, and I made up my mind way back 1970 that I was going to build a company that operated all over the world, and we're in over 100 countries today. And I didn't get that smart. But you want to know the secret? You've got to have a good team. You've got to have a good team. If you're going to have a good team, you've got to be a good team leader. There's excellent leadership in this company. Use them as a model. Make up your mind you're going to do what they tell you. And you're going to win in a big way. Then, this is really the key. Now, I listened to Alec today, and um, he was talking about turning his car into a school. Well, I'm going to show you how I turned my car into a school. This is a record. It's just a little one, but it's a record. And this is a record player. It's a portable record player. I drove around with this for a long time. And I still have it beside my desk. Is it coming? I have listened to that record thousands of times. You see, attitude is something that controls our life. It literally controls our life. As I was listening to this, I was thinking, BK was raised on this. His family raised them on these records. In fact, his dad used to sell them. That's where he started with SMI. Go ahead. His paradigm is manifest in this company. Your paradigm is manifest in yours, in mine, in mine. Our attitude is our way of thinking, feeling, and action. It's everything about us. 
changing attitudes is not a simple thing to do. And without the repetition of information, the same information over and over again, odds are pretty good the attitude will not change. Earl called it the magic word. Well, I played that record over and over and over again thousands of times. And you know something? It's what changed my attitude. Now, it took me nine years to figure, the, figure this out. It was by listening to this information over and over again, the same information. See, if a person's going to change their behavior, if they're going to change their behavior, they have to change their paradigm. If they're going to change their paradigm, they've got to start programming new information into their mind. Because your paradigm is both genetic and environmental. It's been ideas programmed into your subconscious mind before you ever had the ability to think. And if we're going to change it, we're going to have to change it the same way it was programmed. It's totally illogical what we have to do, which is the probable reason so few people do it. Now, this is part of what you're teaching. This is part of the strategy when you bring a new person in. If they don't understand this, odds are pretty good they will not stay. Then you've got to hit them with the big one. They've got to make a commitment. But the commitment is a two-way thing. You don't make it all alone. You've got to make one to them, and they've got to make one to you. I was working at the LAX Marriott here just probably about a month ago. And Sandy Gallagher, who's my business partner, she said, do you want to go for a walk? And I thought, yeah, we'll get out of the hotel. So we're, out, we're walking down Century Boulevard. It was a nice day. And I looked up, and I saw an enormous billboard. And I thought, wow, look at that. That is phenomenal. This is what I was looking at. We don't accept applications, only commitments. Everybody knows that Marines, the United States Marines, are powerful. They have phenomenal training. They build something inside a person. But it's not done by accident. The Marine has to make a commitment, and the Marine to make a commitment. Can you imagine if you approached your new affiliates this way? You see, I think if you don't approach them this way, you're missing something. You've got to get them to make a commitment, and you've got to make a commitment. And then you both have to live up to it. Now, I think this is where the leadership, the education, and the consistent high standards of service come into play in this game. I think this is how it works. This is right in the beginning. And if both of those commitments are not made, it isn't going to work. If they are made, that is when you're all in. You see? It all isn't, isn't a matter of saying, I'm all in. Being all in, it goes two ways. You've got to get them to be all in, and you've got to be all in. You're going to make a real commitment that you're going to be there. And rather than complain because they're not doing something, understand their paradigm is controlling them. And if they're going to do it, you're going to have to help them understand why they're doing what they're doing, why they're not doing the things that they have to do. You may be uncomfortable, but if you're not prepared to pay that price, you don't deserve the reward. I died a thousand deaths getting up in front of an audience, even a little one. Today, I'm very comfortable here. I'm just as comfortable here as if I was at home petting my dog. 
But that doesn't happen by accident. You program yourself for everything you do. And you must, you must understand that your present results are a manifestation of your programming. One of the first things I ask a person if they come to work with me, what's the most you've ever earned in a year? I don't really care what the answer is. But I want to know what the answer is. Because I know the second they tell me that, I know where their paradigm is. And if I'm going to get them to do what I would like to see them do, I'm going to have to get them to change that paradigm. These young people that are making it, I guarantee you, they're changing the paradigm. They wouldn't make it if they didn't. The young people that don't make it, they don't change the paradigm. But that doesn't just do with young people. This is people. It's male and female. It's young and old. We've got to make the commitment. Let's operate like the Marines. Let's really dig into this concept. Let's get retention so deeply sunk in our mind that it's a priority. Everything we do, we're either working towards retention or attrition. You can tell this to anybody, that you can get anything you seriously want, guaranteed. You can get anything you seriously want, guaranteed. The realization of a goal in Vima is not a complicated process. In fact, it's a simple matter of cause and effect, as straightforward, consistent, and reliable as two times two equal four. Now, read that through again. This is something you can sit down and say to somebody, look them square in the eye, and you can say you can get anything you seriously want guaranteed. The realization of a goal in Vima is not a complicated process. In fact, it's a simple matter of cause and effect. As straightforward, consistent, and reliable as two times two equal four. You want to remember, retention is the objective. Freedom is the award, the reward. You've got to stay plugged in. I, um, I started to read this in 1961. I still read it every day. I take it everywhere I go. I have never stopped reading it. If I stop improving what's going on in here, it's going to show up outside. I don't buy the idea that you have to slow down. I don't think anybody has to slow down. I think what we have to do is calm down, smarten up, start to understand who we are. We're God's highest form of creation. There is nothing on the entire planet that will equal the human. We are God's highest form of creation. Are we acting like it? You know that when a person doesn't stay plugged in, pretty soon they leave the business. You'll start to see them less and less. They'll start managing. Then they start complaining. They start blaming. And then they start disappearing. They're on their way out. And you know that everybody that they've had an influence over has been afflicted with what they have. This is such serious business. This is such a phenomenal organization. It offers so much. But you do have to stay plugged in. Daily activity is important because we only live a day at a time. We just live a day at a time.